security remains significant as a challenge in Africa. Here in Nigeria, volatility in global food prices, fluctuations in the value of the Naira, and high inflation rates have led to price increases for both domestic and imported foods. Nigeria currently ranks 103rd out of 120 countries under the Global Hunger Index. As temperature increases, political instability prevails, floods, drought, rising food prices, and erratic energy supplies have all distressed consequences on food supplies. Many African countries require crucial interventions in increasing food production and mitigating the impacts of climate change and buffering energy supplies whilst overhauling the important components of food systems and the respective linkages between these components in order to ensure food security for the population. Well, joining me to discuss this and many of the issues around food security is Indidi Umuneli, Executive Chair, Sahel Consulting, Agriculture and Nutrition. She has over 25 years of international development experience and is the founder of Leap Africa, Changing Narratives Africa and African Food Change Makers. She's also the co-founder of Ace Food Processing and Distribution Limited and sits on the board of the Rockefeller Foundation, the Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition, Agra, Nigerian Breweries PLC, and the Africa Philanthropy Forum. Thank you for joining me this morning, Indidi. So it's great to have you here on Arise. I think it's your first time yes, it yeah, is. on the show. So I guess my first question really is around the ongoing global hunger crisis. What is the implication of this for sustainable development or even achieving the SDGs? Right now, it looks really bleak. Uh, SDG 2 is zero hunger and hunger is rising across the world. Malnutrition is rising across the world. So. Uh, when we think about the implications of the last 24 months on the food economic landscape and the food ecosystem, um, I am really, really, really worried about the state of affairs. Yeah. Interestingly, we've had COVID-19 and we had the Russia-Ukraine crisis. Has it actually been significantly exacerbated now or have those global events just highlighted what are major bottlenecks or challenges already within the global food system? So what COVID-19 demonstrated is how connected we are um, and how dependent we are on other countries. Because with COVID-19, we had supply chain challenges with shipping challenges and delays, reprioritization around health. Um, and then we saw countries closing their borders with the Russia-Ukraine war. Immediately that started. We saw a lot of restrictions on trade um, around food because many countries said, we have to protect our own reserves, our wheat, our grains, because we know what happened in 20, 2007, 2008, the same thing. And it led to rapid increases in prices and the same border closures. So mm. we've seen that same effect, not just on the fertilizer industry and the wheat sector, but in every single sector. Um, and it just shows our, our exposure as countries that are dependent on other countries, where your net trade importers of food uh, where you're not self, food self-sufficient, mm. those are challenges. And countries that are dependent on others for their food will continue to suffer during periods yeah. of crisis and unrest. And you know what was really scary about what you said is, it, I think it took the Russia-Ukraine crisis for, for some of us to realize just how pivotal some countries were right. in the global food system and right. how you had such an imbalance in supply and demand where the greatest need was. But I know that you've recently been involved in global climate talks. COP27 has just finished in Egypt. And there's a very strong link between climate change and food security. What were some of the big messages or narratives going on at COP27 around how we're going to solve the global food crisis? Yeah, so this is my first COP and it's the first time where food was actually recognized for its pivotal role in the climate agenda. The food ecosystem is the largest contributor to greenhouse gas emissions, one third of greenhouse gas emissions because of food waste. Mm -hmm. um, because when we leave all our food to waste, the, it, it emits methane into the atmosphere. Um, and there's significant food waste, one third of our food waste. So we don't realize the magnitude, not just at the farm gate, but even at the table. So that's one. And then we're most impacted by climate change as a sector. Droughts, uh, hotter climates, flooding, affects the food ecosystem, the low cost that affected East Africa over the last two years, those are all effects of climate change. And so the food ecosystem was on the agenda and we had a huge food pavilion and there were lots of sessions around how the food ecosystem has to change, uh, regenerative agriculture, you know, using solar, managing waste, and also our role in mitigating, but also adaptation. Um, and we struggled to have the language in there mm. um, as we required, 
but we saw greater recognition, greater partnerships, and greater collaboration across the sectors. Um, so I'm leaving, I left COP optimistic, but cautiously optimistic because there are so many agendas at COP, so many interests, and everybody's tugging for their own piece of the climate pie, um, not realizing that we really need to collaborate to truly address these issues because we're all affected. Yeah, and you, maybe we can just stay on that COP27 issue because one of the big things that has trailed the COP discussions is the responsibility that developed economies have towards developing countries and this elusive $100 billion of financing for climate adaptation and mitigation. From a food perspective, is there a funding challenge uh, for some of the infrastructure around what it takes to get food from some regions of the world to other regions of the world? And was that part of the narrative at COP27? I think there are two issues at play. One is there's a huge infrastructure gap in our continent. In Nigeria in particular, huge infrastructure gap, which limits our ability to take advantage of the innovations that allow us to leapfrog and to become more climate resilient. We've seen this with flooding. Each year it gets worse and you wonder, we know it's gonna get worse. Mm. Why aren't we doing anything about it? Why aren't we managing water better? What about bridges? What about our dams? What about how we build infrastructure? So there is an infrastructure gap and a funding gap for infrastructure, period. And it affects the food ecosystem, but it affects every single sector. Now, is Nigeria well positioned? to absorb that type of financing. And this is the challenge with many of African countries. We say we need the financing, the financing is there, but there is a gap between our ability to absorb the financing, the right private sector partners, the public sector organizations that can demonstrate accountability and transparency. Because I sit on the global fronts on many of these, and you know, Rockefeller Foundation has this global alliance for energy, uh, for people and planet. And Nigeria is a focused country and we often, I challenge them, why aren't you partnering more with local organizations? And they're like, we want to show me the local organization. So I think we have a act, uh, our own role to play in attracting and retaining the climate financing. There is money available for Africa and for Nigeria. I'm not sure we're well positioned to ab absorb, absorb that it. money at this time. Yeah. And, and so there's, a chicken and egg, which one comes first? Now, both have to be done. We need to be ready to absorb the capital. We need to demonstrate that we can use the capital effectively. The global economy also needs to wake up to the fact that there are local organizations and local partners ready to absorb this capital. And it's really about mm. collaborative financing. Um, every single player was there at this cup. When I went to Nigerian Pavilion, I saw my friends who I was like, okay, what are you doing here? They're like <laughs> climate financing, you know? Yeah. Energy was there, the food ecosystem, obviously. Infrastructure teams were there and there were quite a few organizations They were ready. Now the question is, are they ready and can they absorb yeah. the climate financing? Very, very interesting. Now, if we bring it down to the local context, every year, I feel like as an economy, we're facing the same issue. A high holiday season is approaching. The price of basic commodities and goods, soft commodities are going to go up. What is it specifically about this market that causes that suddenly, that high sensitivity to inflation to trigger directly into commodity and food prices? And how is it affecting communities and livelihoods? Well, Nigeria has failed to prioritize the food ecosystem and to invest in it. And right now we're facing multiple crises. We're facing a serious insecurity crisis. Farmers cannot go to eat to farm because they're worried about being kidnapped. And we see that every day. We're facing challenges around infrastructure where our roads are dehabilitated and the cost of transporting product, produce from the farm to the factories is uh, exorbitant. The energy crisis continues to soar, which affects the production cost in our country, Nigeria is uncompetitive relative to other countries when it comes to producing food locally, even where we have a natural comparative advantage in the value chain. And then we're seeing challenges around our entire ecosystem being broken with so many middlemen along the chain. And that creates inefficiencies from farm to fork, you know, from farm to table. We have at least 10 players across the ecosystem mm. when you should actually have a more efficient, more transparent, accountable value chain where data flows, where pricing flows. And so when, when you have those inefficiencies, you have hoarders, you have, you know, what we call artificial people, shortages, artificial shortages yeah. caused by really unscrupulous people who want to make three times the profits they should be making at the expense of Nigerians. So I think there are multiple actions that need to be taken urgently. I often say, I mean, we did a rice value chain study a few years ago, and I was shocked that the landed price of rice versus what Nigerians pay 
there's a huge gap. Uh, what, what sort of gap monopoly. are we talking about? It's, it's a three or four fold gap. Wow. So when you have a monopoly in the rice value chain that continues to frustrate the local production of rice, of course you will continue to see gaps. When Nigerians are paying 10 times or mm. three times what they should pay for rice, um, when we could be rice self-sufficient in this country. So yeah. that's one. I and mean, it's Christmas season. Everybody wants to eat rice and chicken. So you see these inefficiencies and it directly affects us. We have double-digit food inflation, right? We have the average Nigerian saying, I can only do zero, one, zero. I can only have one meal a day. And even when I have that meal, I can't have an egg or I can't have a piece of meat because I can't afford it. That directly impacts malnutrition. Of course. Hidden hunger, stunting. And so if one third of our children are stunted, it means that 10 years from now, 20 years from now, the productivity of our workforce is reduced because mm. the brain development is stunted. Yeah. Dr. Kiwu Miyadishina has a quote which says, a stunted child today, a stunted group of children today is a stunted country tomorrow. Of course. Um, so the mm. ramifications, the generational ramifications of this food crisis are immense and troubling. And so that's why I feel this sense of urgency that we need collaboration across the board to address these challenges. Yeah, and we'll talk about what that collaboration and policy solutions, but in terms of Nigeria's competitive advantage from a food production perspective, what do we really have a competitive advantage in, all things being equal? In a world where we didn't have flooding and all these other supply chain issues, what is our competitive advantage? So there are at least five value chains where we have competitive advantage. Cassava is one where Literally, Nigeria can be the world producer of cassava. We can actually compete with the Vietnams of this world who mm. are actually demonstrating what you can do with the cassava value chain. Yam, we still have a competitive advantage in yam. Soya, our soya is one of the best in the world. Ginger, okra. So there are few value chains, you know, where we actually can compete globally because of our natural, the varieties we grow, but also our natural endowment as a country. We can become self-sufficient in rice, but we are not, despite what the government likes to say. We're still a net importer of rice. We're still a net importer of maize, which obviously impacts the profit profitability of the poultry value chain. The poultry value chain has grown and can be a very successful value chain, but because of its dependence on imported soya and maize, it's not as competitive as it should be. Um, we're struggling in all the others. Many areas, yeah. <laughs> Still net importers of even palm oil, where we used to be a net exporter. Of course, Countries yeah. like Cote d'Ivoire have overtaken us when it comes to cocoa, palm oil, pineapples, yams, wow. the most <laughs> basic value chain. And Ghana is now a net exporter of a lot of the value chains that we used to boast about yeah. as well. In fact, you know, we always had those stories about Nigeria and palm oil right from, you yeah. know, back in primary school. Really incredible. One of the things I think about is the workforce that is needed to really grow this sector and, and take it to the height that it needs to be. Are we seeing expertise really over generations being prepared to serve the food industry from farm to, to table? Definitely not. And in fact, that's one of the reasons at Sahel, we actually started the Sahel Scholars Program and I wrote this book, Food Entrepreneurs in Agriculture, because I recognize that the curriculum that we've been teaching our children in universities and even primary schools is agriculture as a science, not agriculture as a business. Right. And our curriculum is still in the dark ages from the 1970s. It doesn't leverage innovation, technology, data. You know, the great advances that have enabled us to leapfrog. Um, and so we need to revamp our educational curriculum. We need to inf educate our policymakers. And Sahel has been doing a lot with training the Federal Ministry of Agriculture staff with partnership with the Gates Foundation to prepare them to understand policies, to understand ag and food in the 21st century. And that Nigeria can become self-sufficient and a food superpower mm. if only we embrace this sector and invested in it. Yeah, I mean, a food superpower, that's music to our ears. Well, we'll take a short break now. And when we'll return, the discussion around global food security and the impact on Nigeria's economy and agricultural sector continues with Indidi Umuneli. Welcome back to Business Week here on Arise News. I've been chatting with Indidi Umuneli, Executive Chair Sahel Consulting Agriculture and Nutrition. So we were talking about the potential for Nigeria to be a food superpower. One of the questions I have for you is really around the fact that across many sectors, technology has been a major catalyst for growth and acceleration. What are some of the trends we're seeing in the food space now with regards to technology? Yeah, so the exciting thing is that there is investment in technology in Nigeria. We have national research institutes 
We have the IITA, the International Institute of Tropical Agriculture, that have invested in new seed varieties that are drought resistant, that are very productive, that are address also a lot of the climate challenges that we discuss, and we're commercializing them. Um, we're getting them into the hands of farmers. That's where technology starts, at the farm gate. So it's seeds, it's also equipment. Mm. We don't want to invest in hoes and cutlasses anymore. They're harvesters, they're solar driven, you know, equipment across the board, irrigation, solar powered irrigation equipment that allow us to ensure that we can plant all year round. The dependency on rain fed agriculture is not sustainable, where you're only planting when the rain is falling. You can plant Because climate all change year has round. even turned the climate of course, on its head. It has, yeah. it has. And now we have aeroponics. You can grow with soilless farming, where you can grow yam without soil. You know what I mean? There is technology in Nigeria that's affordable. And our research institutes have developed it and it's been commercialized. Mm. So that's an exciting thing. We're also seeing innovation and technology in logistics, right? In processing, in distribution, and lots of uh, great innovations that connect consumers directly to farmers so that you don't even have to go through the middleman. You can order on your phone, you can order you know, a, a completed meal. Um, so those logistics and the dot-com generation have also filtered mm. in to enable the ease of transfer. You know, you have yeah. the Hello Tractors that are the Ubers of tractors and you have the lorry systems and uh, Kobo 3, 3, 360 that use technology to get produce from mm. farm to processors. So we're seeing that technology as well. And then we're also seeing a lot of interesting online um, support structures. I started Africa Food Change Makers and it's a one-stop shop for ag and food entrepreneurs to get data and funding mm. and training and support. And it's completely free. And we now work with entrepreneurs in 37 African countries to enable us to scale the ecosystem. And our vision is a million entrepreneurs creating this $1 trillion yeah. industry. Um, and so we're seeing technology leapfrog and enable us to leapfrog as entrepreneurs in the ecosystem. But the cost of technology and the availability and the accessibility is still too high for the average yeah. uh, Nigerian. And many people also don't know about these advances. So I'll encourage a lot more to get involved. And that's why Africa Food Change Makers was created. Yeah, and I really love the fact that you brought up the word leapfrog because yeah. we've seen technology help sectors leapfrog. But with any sort of leapfrog like we saw in telecoms or banking, policy and regulation become key to ensure that that leapfrogging becomes sustainable. What are some of the big policy initiatives that you are excited by that you think will really help transform the sector? So the number that we have proposed, whether they're, they being, they're adopted? being adopted <laughs> is the challenge in our country. And we often see this. So we had this whole vision ex exercise, vision 2050. And I was the chair of the Policy Commission on Agriculture, Rural Development and Food Security. We came up with a great, you know, 10 point agenda. Um, and the first thing is really prioritization. We can't do all things, right? You asked me what priority value chains, and I told you the priority value chains we have a natural competitive advantage in. That's where we should focus our mm. energy. Nigeria is not going to become a wheat producer, right? We don't have the right climatic climate. We didn't wake up eating bread. I don't know if you woke up eating bread where you were growing up. I grew up in Enugu, would have akara and yam for breakfast. Those are things we grow in Nigeria. Yeah, those are really traditional, yeah, they're close traditional. to home. They fill you yeah. up, they're healthy. You know what I mean? Yeah. So let's grow what we can and export our excess and let the rest of the world grow Indeed. what it is. So the first policy pr agenda is prioritize which value chains we invest in and invest in them from farm to fork. Indeed. The second is really around financing for agriculture and food security, prioritizing women, removing a lot of the barriers. And, and I'm glad that you're the anchor for this. You understand that in our ecosystem, women still are shortchanged, mm. right? So w women farmers generate 30% of the value of their male counterparts yeah. because they can't have access to seeds and fertilizer because there's discrimination around land. The same across the ecosystem. You don't see, you call it middle men, you don't call it middle yeah. women. And you so, know, it's, yeah. it's, it's a really fascinating conversation. I'm glad you mentioned farmers and women farmers because I do think we need to bridge the gap. You yeah. talked about the middlemen. But one last question for you. Yeah. This Black Sea Grain Initiative, briefly, what impact is it going to have on global food supplies? It's very short lived, right? The whole Black Sea Initiative is basically saying, let's ensure that trade can continue from Ukraine and Ukraine can continue to export it's wheat. Okay. And it's short lived because yes, the dependency on Ukraine is something that we've seen with the, I, we love Ukraine, we support them, but we have to become self-sufficient in our region. Yes. We cannot be dependent on Ukraine and Russia for wheat and fertilizer. 
You know what I mean? Yeah. We, this is a wake-up call. COVID was a wake-up call. This is a bigger wake-up call for Nigeria and for other African nations. What can you become self-sufficient mm. in? How can you grow your domestic production and consumption? Thank you. And how can you diversify? So food self-sufficiency. It's yes. been so great speaking to you, Indidio Wunelli. Thank you for being on our program. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you.